years ago, America's greatest archaeologist, William Albright, made an amazing claim. He said that the Dead Sea Scrolls were the greatest find of our time. Now, this is an academic. Academics do not easily make such a claim. My dear friends, how can we dare to say that this is the greatest archaeological find of modern time? Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls, number one, contain new information on early Judaism. The Dead Sea Scrolls also give us new information about Christian origins. Christians are excited about the Dead Sea Scrolls. These documents go back to 250 BC. Many were old by the time that Jesus walked this earth. They give us much information relating to the origins of the Christian faith. Of course, the scrolls give us information about Jesus. Now, these are not Christian scrolls, but I can show you a scroll that gives us the Beatitudes, gives us Beatitudes long before Jesus ever said them. I can show you another scroll that gives you the very words of Jesus as he quotes them in, in the synagogue at Nazareth. The, the scrolls are very important for understanding Christian origins. And even Paul himself, the great apostle, he uses some language that is found only in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The scrolls are, have turned on its head much of biblical scholarship by taking us right back with authentic documents to the time of Jesus and Paul and much earlier. And of course the Dead Sea Scrolls are very important for understanding the Bible. Here we have the oldest Bible manuscripts in the world. The scrolls are important for understanding the, the validity of the Bible. The scrolls tell us about the accuracy of the Bible. For the first time, we can compare manuscripts that are medieval with scrolls that are pre-Christian. And we can prove to you, word for word, that the scrolls demonstrate that the Bible is accurate. And we can even show you in the Dead Sea Scrolls new readings. They're really old readings of the biblical text that are so powerful that they've been incorporated and included in modern Bible translations. There's at least 200, maybe 300 readings that I could show you tonight that have been included in modern Bibles. So my dear friends, I submit to you, we are dealing with the greatest discovery of our time. Now, very, very quickly, we won't spend much time on this, but what are these Dead Sea Scrolls? I, I do this because I once gave a lecture in the States, and this lady at the end, she said, Dr. Flint, I love your lecture, but I don't understand what are these Dead Sea Squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> so they are scrolls, not squirrels. Okay. Now, the, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in a place called Qumran, but in other sites such as Murabaat, Nachal Kheba, and Masada. And, and many of you may have been on this bus journey. You take a bus journey from, a, from Jerusalem to a place called Qumran. There over, before us, on the eastern sky, stands the holy city of Jerusalem. We're about to take the most amazing bus journey on earth, because as we travel, we come to sea level. We will not be going to sea level, my friends, but 1,300 feet below sea level to the lowest spot on the face of this earth, the Dead Sea. And there it is, seven times saltier than the oceans of the world. I used to say in my lectures, there are no fish in the Dead Sea, but I was proved wrong. In Israel, a scholar said, oh no, Dr. Flint, there, there's, there are lots of fish in the Dead Sea. They come down the Jordan River but they're all dead. <laughs> and that is true. This man on the right, Muhammad the Wolf, changed history in 1947. He threw a stone into a cave and he heard the sound of breaking pottery. It was not the pots, my friends, that made the difference, but was in the jars, the, the Dead Sea Scroll. Scrolls were found in these actual jars from Qumran including the great Isaiah scroll. Amazing. The book of Isaiah, uh, written, copied 100 BC, almost virtually intact, found in cave number one. So, so accurate, so, so um, well-preserved, that even scholars doubted 
they could be so ancient. All seven of the Cave One scrolls are housed at a museum called the Shrine of the Book in Jerusalem. This is an amazing museum. Uh, on the left is a white roof. On the, on the right is a black granite slab to symbolize the eternal struggle between light and darkness, good and evil. You see, these people at Qumran, the Essenes, they call themselves the Sons of Light, and the bad guys were the Sons of Darkness. This is a museum dedicated to the Dead Sea Scrolls. The architecture reflects the very Dead Sea Scrolls. You see that? The, the top of a jar, the top of the museum, imitates the top of a Qumran jar. But what about all the other scrolls? We've said seven scrolls are found in the Shrine of the Book. What about all the others? Well, there are 11 caves altogether. And this one in the middle of your picture is cave number four. A very dangerous cave to, to, to get into. You go vertically 14 feet down into the cave. And when you drop below, this is what you will find today. The, the clay has, has been cleared out. But this was the mother load. This was the treasure trove. And nearly 700 manuscripts were found in this one cave. Uh, there is no find like this in history. One cave, so many manuscripts, the oldest copies of the scriptures in the world, and stunning new documents revealing much about Judaism and Christian origins. Look at that, just one, to give you a sample. The commentary on Hosea. The first commentaries ever written on scripture. Uh, commentaries were invented by the Essenes. Isn't that amazing? The Bible commentaries were invented there. Until 2003, most of these cave four scrolls were housed at a museum called the Rockefeller Museum. And there it is. Many of the editors have done our work in the basement of the Rockefeller Museum. Um, um, it's a very interesting story. It has its own romance. <coughs> the original team of Dead Sea Scrolls editors. This is historic footage I'm showing you right now, my friends. There they are, sorting out the thousands and thousands of pieces in what is known as the scrollery. These were pieces of manuscripts all jumbled together and uh, that people didn't know what it was. Biblical texts they could identify and other texts, they, they were just unknown. And so these editors spent a long, long time just sorting out the massive jigsaw puzzle. Let me put it this way. It's like having a thousand jigsaw puzzles without the box cover. <laughs> Very difficult to identify the pieces, especially when they've been mixed together. Over 90% of the Qumran scrolls are now housed at the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. There are plans to build a huge museum where they can all be shown to the public but this is something for the future. Now, what about the caves and the people who lived at Qumran? This is fascinating in itself. Here we have the Qumran site. You can see the caves in the middle, and there down below are the ruins of the buildings. Now, you might say, oh, well, these are old ruins. How boring. Oh, no. Not boring, my friend. Because Qumran is the only site in ancient Israel which yielded manuscripts from the second temple period, when the temple still stood. So the archaeology and the scrolls from the caves can be studied together. We, we study the community, how they lived, what they did, and we study the manuscripts that they produced and that they hid in the caves. There's no other site like that in ancient Israel. Here is Father Roland de Vaux, the first chief editor of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the excavator of Qumran. Uh, it's very interesting. I mention this because some people might say, you know, I, I don't like manuscripts so much. I like the archaeology. Well, my friend, there's something for you in the scrolls. Plan of the Qumran site. It's an amazing site. We have uh, many ruins, but large cisterns. Perhaps you can see in the middle, there's a large pool uh, towards the left in the middle. A large pool that was filled with water. So much water was found at Qumran. Far more than was needed for drinking purposes. Because you see, they practiced ritual immersion. Some use the word baptism. The broken stairs leading into a pool. We think that the broken stairs were caused by a tremendous earthquake 
which hit this area in 31 BC. Here we have a pre-Christian ritual bath used for baptism. Now that's a Christian word, but look at the scrolls. Here is one, the community rules. No one may enter the water unless he is repentant of his evil, because uncleanness clings to all transgressors of his word. But it's this room that draws our attention, the scriptorium, where scrolls were copied. We now have the very benches at which they sat, and we have three precious inkwells, maybe four now, in fact, inkwells that they use, the very means of production of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, I must move on. The Dead Sea Scrolls, well, we divide them into two main groups, Bible and non-Bible. That makes sense. If you get a scroll that says Genesis, that's a Bible scroll. <laughs> and if it's, if it's not Genesis, it's non-Biblical. So, there are about 300 Biblical scrolls. When Dr. Abing and I started lecturing on these, this topic about 20 years ago, the number was 250. But the number keeps going up and up as more and more scrolls slowly come to light. Uh, I'm not going to show you all 300, but here we have a, a part of Genesis. Now remember, uh, we have many Genesis scrolls, and so much of the book is preserved. A Genesis scroll from cave number four, the magnificent Leviticus scroll, published by David Noel Friedman, from cave 11, written in Paleo-Hebrew, special ancient writing, the All Souls Deuteronomy scroll. Now this one's really special. This may look just like a piece of leather to many, but my friends, here we have the oldest copy of the Ten Commandments in the world. How's that? When the Deuteronomy scroll came to Toronto about seven years ago, it was floating for one week by the Israelis because it is so fragile. I kid you not, people were queued around the block just to see the Deuteronomy scroll, to be able to say that I stood near to the oldest copy of, of the Ten Commandments in the entire world. What an amazing manuscript. By the way, it's called the All Souls Deuteronomy Scroll because the richest church in the world, which is in Wall Street, you know about this? There's a very rich church called All Souls Episcopal Church. They made a large donation and so they named the scroll after the church. So if you like a scroll named after you, you just give a million dollars to, to the Dead Sea Scrolls Institute. How's that? Here is the great psalm scroll from cave 11. A wonderful scroll that I'm actually uh, we are working on. I'm working on this right now, doing the edition. Uh, produced by Professor James Sanders back in the 60s. An amazing scroll, with, including new psalms and apocryphal psalms that are of great interest to scholars. Isaiah. Now you, now you might say, I don't like this. This doesn't look like Dead Sea Scrolls. This looks like the remains of a barbecue. <laughs> or the Dead Sea Scraps. <laughs> but my friends, in these bruised and battered bits is written the very stuff that dreams are made of. When you take all the Isaiah Scrolls together, they bear stunning testimony to the book of Isaiah in antiquity the book that is quoted so often in the New Testament, the Daniel scroll from cave number four. Now you might say, look at that scroll. Remember, this is pristine. This is, this is undiscovered country. This is virgin territory. These are manuscripts that have not been worked on before. There's even, a, there's even Greek scrolls. There's about 25 Greek scrolls. If you like Greek, there's something in it for you. New scrolls. Now, Dr. Abeg and myself and some of our students have had the privilege of working on new scrolls that have come to light in recent years. They're not really new, they're really old, but they weren't known. They were kept in a bank vault in Switzerland. By the way, uh, Dr. Davis is here. He's also worked on these manuscripts. I acknowledge that. Well, in 2010 to 11, Southwestern Baptist Seminary in Fort Worth, they, they put forward a couple of million dollars to buy eight fragments of Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Psalms, and David, uh, and Daniel. These show you the importance that seminaries and Christian colleges attach to the Dead Sea Scrolls. If there's something worth paying two million dollars for, it must be something very special. 
and this is one of their pride, uh, uh, one of their prides of, of, of this hmm. seminary, is these Dead Sea Scrolls. I've visited the seminary, and I kid you not, they're kept in a bank vault, in a vault inside the president's house. And when we worked, when I worked on these scrolls with the team, uh, a, a security guard had to sit there watching us. They are that precious. There is one of them, a new Leviticus scroll from cave number four. Ten years ago, no one would see these pictures. These are new, undiscovered scrolls that have just come to light very, very recently. The Green Collection is a very wealthy family called the Greens who have a store called Hobby Lobby. Have you heard of that? In Oklahoma City. They, they, Mr. Green, as he grew old, he said, I want to make a difference. I would like to make a large donation that makes a difference. So he put forward millions of dollars to buy manuscripts because he figured that for Jews and for Christians that manuscripts are important and especially for studying the Word of God and Christian origins. So the Greens have a huge museum that is being built in Washington, D.C. And they've put forward several million dollars to buy at least 12 scrolls. Kippy, is it 13 now? 13 scrolls. Again, Christians putting forward uh, money because they realize the importance of Dead Sea Scrolls. Genesis, Psalms, and Micah, to name a few. There is one of them. The Genesis scroll from K4. My dear friends, this may not seem much to many of you, but they give us amazing testimony to the faithfulness of, that, that of God in preserving His Word. Your fathers and grandfathers or grandparents, they could not take scrolls and show them to others and say, look, how, look here, my Bible is ancient. My Bible is accurate. We now can do this through careful scholarship on these biblical scrolls. So what does all that mean for you and for me? Well, first of all, let's ask the question, which biblical books are not found among the scrolls? That's a good question. What biblical books are not found among the scrolls? Ten years ago, we used to say two books. One was Nehemiah. People would say Nehemiah is not found among the scrolls. But due to recent developments, we now can confirm Nehemiah is found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. And there they are, two, two Nehemiah Scrolls. One in the Scorian Collection, one in the Green Collection. This may not seem much, what I'm showing you now, but it's very important. We did not know, we could not prove that the book of Nehemiah really was in existence in the pre-Christian period. Now we can prove that. But there's one book that is not found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Anybody know what that strange, rather mysterious book is called? You're right, there it is. The book of Esther has not been found. Very interesting. And Esther, as you may know, is the only book in the Bible that does not contain the name of God. Did you know that? Very secular book. But actually the reason it was not found in Qumran is not related to that. It's related to festivals. That's for another time. Now, how will the scrolls affect your Bible? What difference do they make to my Bible? Well, the biblical scrolls are up to 1,250 years older than the traditional Hebrew Bible, what we call the Masoretic text. Did you know that your Bible is based on manuscripts that are only 1,000 years old? Yes. There it is. Biblia Hebraica Stuttgardense. If you go to seminary or university or college, that is the Bible that we read. Now you might say, that doesn't look a thousand years old to me, that looks maybe 50 years old. Well my friends, what that is, the Bible we use today is the printed version of the real old manuscript called the Leningrad Codex, kept in Russia, 1008 AD, the oldest complete Bible in the whole world. But it's only a thousand years old. Amazing. You believe your Bible is much older than that, but that is the Bible we use today. Uh, we didn't really have anything older than that. But now through looking at the Dead Sea Scrolls and also at Greek manuscripts, we can go much, much further back. And we can actually demonstrate that our Bible is accurate. Look, there's one. Remember the Old Souls Deuteronomy Scroll? Here we can see the oldest copy of the Ten Commandments. We can compare it to the Leningrad Codex. 
And when we do a careful comparison, the scrolls confirm the accuracy of the biblical text. My old professor in South Africa used to speak about God's inspiration of Scripture and God's providence with respect to Scripture. That God providentially cared for the handing down of the text. He inspired the Scriptures and he took care that it was handed down very faithfully and very, very accurately. The rabbis took every precaution to, to copy and preserve the Word of God. And the scrolls confirm this. I must say something about the non-biblical scrolls. The non-biblical scrolls were essential reading for understanding the ideas and the outlook of the Quran community. In other words, they're not Bible, but they show us the slant. They show us the outlook. They show us the, the distinctive ideas of these people who lived in the in, in the Nephilim so long ago. Here is one of them, a mysterious document, the community rule. Catholics will know what this is about. Have you heard of the rule of St. Benedict? A sort of rule book by which the people of God must live. Here is a special rule book that was written for the Qumran community. Fascinating documents that give us an insight onto who these people were. The Damascus document. They talked about fleeing to a place called Damascus, and scholars have wondered where this is. These are sectarian scrolls. They give us insight into <coughs> the group, the Essene, responsible for the Dead Sea Scrolls. These non-biblical scrolls are very important. These books, they, they, they fill in the missing uh, the blanks between the Old and New Testament. The Old Testament ends with Ezra and Nehemiah and Chronicles. The New Testament starts with Matthew. We have like several hundred silent years in between. These are the books that throw uh, light and give us insight onto those silent years. The last words of Moses from Cave 1. Wow. Did Moses have last words? Well, there were writings about in the centuries before Jesus which Jews sort of put together. They said, well, Moses, he must have had the last will and testament. He was such a great man. And they, they have these last words of Moses. It may not tell us exactly about Moses, but it tells us much about the people, these Jews, who, who put these words into his mouth. The last words of Moses. Of course, if you really are a, um, let's say, new to the field, you might say, hey, I found the actual last words of Moses. But scholars are more careful. Uh, they say, well, maybe not. Commentary on Nahum, the Nahum Pesha, Again, Bible commentaries were invented at Qumran. Here we have a very interesting commentary that tells us much about these Jews, the Essenes, the wicked priests, and, 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 and uh, the teacher of righteousness. Very, very important. We have um, the Dead Sea Scrolls were essential reading for understanding the interpretation and application of Torah. Here is a, an amazing document called 4QMMT. Some of the works of the law. And this work says, if you want to be a good Jew, this is how you need to live. These are the laws you need to obey. These are the ideas you need to embrace. A very important document. So, some of the works of the law. The scrolls are essential reading for understanding Jewish mysticism. Let's say some of you tonight are mystics. You really are into mysticism. You want to know about the inner life, the spiritual life. Well... We have mysterious documents. Uh, these, some of these people at Qumran were myst mystics. The book of mysteries, the unfolding of revelation. Very, very interesting. If, you, if you're into that type of, of study, uh, this, there's something there for you. The book of mysteries. They're essential reading for understanding messianism and the end times. In this room tonight, we all believe in the Messiah, the end times, the end of the world. These Jews living out in the desert just before the time of Jesus also believed in the, in the Messiah. They believed in the end times. And so it's very important. Here we have the book of Enoch, a fascinating book that talks about Enoch who is up in heaven being revealed all sorts of mysteries by the angels. And, and it's about heaven and hell and angels and demons. It's sort of like Dante's Inferno. You know Dante's Inferno? 
This is like Dante's Inferno on steroids. <laughs> Powerful. All these angels and devils and eating and, and screaming. And, and it's, it's very, very dramatic. The book of Enoch. And there are people in the Christian church who have used Enoch over the centuries. The, the Dead Sea Strolls are essential reading for understanding the person and ministry of Jesus. Here is a scroll. It may not seem like much, but it's called the Messianic Apocalypse. It actually mentions the word Messiah. It's a very, very important document. This document demonstrates that Jesus saw himself as and claimed to be a prophetic Messiah. Now you might say, well, duh, I knew that. Well, <laughs> not so fast. If you look at the scriptures, it's very difficult to find a scripture where Jesus claims to be the Messiah. We, got, we have the feeling Jesus claims to be Messiah, but in fact, it's, it's called the Messianic secret. He's very reluctant to say, I'm the Messiah. But we can now take this scroll, compare it to, to Luke 4 and Luke 7, and show that when Jesus stood up at Nazareth, he was claiming to be the Messiah. A wonder-working, prophetic Messiah. A very, very powerful scroll that you actually uses the word Messiah. The scrolls are essential reading for understanding the Battle of Armageddon. The Battle of Armageddon. Revelation chapter 16. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Can you hear the drums? Can you hear the battle about to approach? We we'll read this in the scriptures. But the battle of Armageddon is also described in the Dead Sea Scrolls. In fact, in Revelation, that's all we have in Armageddon. But it fills out the story dramatically in the scrolls. There it is, the war scroll. I'd like to give a nod tonight to my colleague Dr. Abeg, who's here. The authority on the war scroll. Preparing an edition of the war scroll. The war between the sons of light and the sons of darkness. I guarantee that one day there'll be a movie about this. <laughs> the Battle of Armageddon at the end of time. There's so much we could say. The sons of light and the forces of darkness, this is a quote, will fight together to show the strength of God with the roar of a great multitude and the shout of gods and men. A day of disaster. The, the, here you get the Battle of Armageddon fleshed out uh, in many, many rounds. And it's a very, very interesting study. In fact, at Qumran, they even had a, a, a tower. We call it the Battle Tower. Arrowheads were found there. We believe that uh, uh, when the Romans attacked Qumran in 68 AD, the people, the, the, the Essenes, they gathered on top of the tower. They, they thought the day of Armageddon had come. They were waiting for the angels to intervene, to, to wipe out the evil Romans, and yet that never happened. The Romans destroyed them and destroyed the settlement. So they, what happened to them, their belief may have been wrong, but the way they believed is very interesting. They believed in the coming day of Armageddon. And what this says for the Christian is this. There were Jews waiting for the battle of Armageddon. Revelation is not made up. It is validated. And that Christians have every right and every hope to wait for that great battle at the end of time. I must come to a close, but there's so much more I can tell you. The Dead Sea Scrolls are essential reading for understanding the New Jerusalem. Um, in, in the book of Revelation, we hear about, read about the New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. A very dramatic scripture. Uh, the, the great city that, that comes down from heaven that, down to earth. Well, I'll just read you an a, a excerpt. And one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls, full of the seven last plagues, came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And in the spirit he carried me away to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. Isn't that amazing? The, the holy city itself. Well, we now have a new Jerusalem scroll with six manuscripts. And there it is. Amazing. It, it, it doesn't quote Revelation, but it gives us a different take on the new Jerusalem. And in fact, a heavenly guide 
shows the author of the scroll, the features and architecture of the New Jerusalem, uh, the gates, the streets, the layout of the city. Well, um, I've, I've said enough. I'm now going to introduce Andrew Perrin, uh, our new co-director uh, of the Dead Sea Scrolls Institute, one of our own students here at Trinity Western. He went on to um, McMaster University to do his doctorate, and he produced a book uh, called The Dynamic, the Dynamics of Dream Visions um, in the Aramaic Dead Sea Scroll. I'd like to hand over to you now, Dr. Perrin. Thank you. Give him a hand.